Okay, very good. And um, again, good evening, and thank you so much for attending our Family Academy session on this uh, Thursday, October 6th. I'm Dr. Narina Hepokin, and I thank all of our participants, our families, our guests, and of course, our interpreters on this Zoom. Um, again, this event is being recorded so that we can post it on the Parent Engagement website for anyone who missed the session. Please keep yourself on mute during tonight's presentation. And we will have different sections that uh, our presenters will go over. And after each section, if you have questions, you can put it on the chat, um, in the chat, and we will be able to answer the questions as they come up after each of those sections. And then of course, at the end, um, if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, you may um, ask questions uh, then as well. So again, tonight's presentation is brought to you by our teaching and learning department here at Glendale Unified. Um, the title is the home school connection 10 ways parents can help their children succeed at school thank you so much for our teaching and learning department for being here our team and for presenting tonight i will turn it over to you and so you can introduce yourself and uh, the floor is all yours wonderful thank you narine for having us this evening and i would like to welcome our new director of teaching and learning lena kortoshian who's joining us tonight and um, we are so happy to see you lena did you want to tell the families about you and um just tell them a little bit about you and when you might be starting with us sure good evening everyone i'm so excited to join you tonight so I'm Lena Kortoshian, as Rebecca said, I've been working in GOSD for 32 years, wearing multiple hats as a teacher, uh, as an um, assistant principal, associate principal, and for the last um, the six plus years, if we count the beginning of this year as well, um, I am the principal of Clark Magnet High School, and also hopefully, Next week, I will be down at Teaching and Learning. Um, I was appointed as Teaching Director of Teaching and Learning in August, but until uh, the, this, the Board of Education and the Superintendent appoints the Clark's principal, I will not be able to leave. And I want to thank Teaching and Learning team for their patience while I, you know, what I had to navigate and try to help them as much as I could from up in the locker center area where Clark is. So, and I am really excited to join them next week and get, the, you know, pick up the torch and we're going to be running soon. Wonderful. Yes, we are. We are. I'm Rebecca Milwaukee. I'm the coordinator of teaching and learning. This is my seventh month in Glendale Unified, so I'm pretty new to the role, but it's my 26th year in public education. I'm a very veteran middle school English teacher. I also um, have run new teacher induction programs, onboarding our brand new teachers in Burbank, and worked a little bit with Sally Miles in Glendale about helping new teachers get situated and learn the Glendale way. And I'm also, most importantly, the mother of a school-aged child who has matriculated through Glendale schools and is now in college. So lots of the tips and the tricks and the techniques that we'll share with you are born out of our experience as educators and as parents of school-aged children. So I'd like to introduce you to my partner in this project tonight, Ms. Danielle Fox. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We are excited to share um, our tips and tricks. As Rebecca mentioned, we have a wealth of uh, educator experience, but more importantly, we are also parents. So we get it and our best interest at heart is to help support you supporting them at home and making that homeschool connection. So without further ado, um, thank you. Our screen. And let me know if you are able to see this. Danielle, thumbs up. Can everybody see? Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. So we're going to begin tonight. And by the way, Danielle didn't mention it, but she has school-age kids at home as well. That I she do. Helps. 
with homework and projects and all the kinds of things that happen when you're a mom or a dad or a guardian of kids in school. And so what we've done for you tonight is we've broken the landscape, if you will, into four big buckets. And inside each bucket, we will share some ideas for how you can support your sons and daughters and children. And at the end of each section, if you have questions about what we've shared, please put them in the chat and we'll pause at the end of each section to take those questions and to dig in a little deeper about something that you'd like to know more about. We're going to begin tonight with organization. Organization <laughs> is so essential. And I'll lead us off with tip one. One of the best ways that you can set your student up for success at home is by making sure that there's a space at home where your child can work on schoolwork does not have to be anything fancy, does not have to be an entire room or even an entire desk, but it can simply be some counter space or a bookshelf or somewhere in the home where the child can go to to do schoolwork. It should be comfortable, it should be well lit, it should have easy access to the supplies that students need to do schoolwork, things like paper, glue, scissors, markers, pens, rulers, a computer if that's something you, you can have at home for them. And every kid in Glendale Unified has a, a tech device, so that part should be easy. You could also provide reference materials like dictionaries, digital encyclopedias, access to other media that the student can use to help complete schoolwork. Helping the child keep this area neat and clean and a place they go to each day is really important as well. Another thing you can do at home to make sure that your child is poised for success is to make sure that there's a schedule by which we go to that space at home to do schoolwork. And we're not saying there's any hard or fast law that says homework can only be done in that space. But if we want to create conditions that lead to a more successful outcome where school becomes a priority and is important, one of the ways you model that value is by creating that space at home and asking your child to visit that space at home to do the schoolwork. You can stick to the schedule by which you work in the school workspace. You can have snacks in that area and you can help when you are in school work time at home, break the work time up into manageable time chunks so that the work gets done without it feeling like it's a terrible grind and they can't leave that area until it's done. That's not a great thing to do. Third, motivate and monitor the child when they are at home in the workspace working on schoolwork. So check in every once in a while. I would often be cooking in the kitchen and my son would be doing schoolwork at the breakfast counter and I would turn around and check in. If he had questions, I was right there to have them asked of me. I was available and I was interested in what he was doing. When the homework time was over, it was really important that we closed that moment of our day and made sure that completed assignments got back into folders, back into a notebook, or that all the books and the materials got put back in the backpack so that tomorrow when they return back to a uh, school mindset, all they have to do is pick up that backpack or pick up their books, the book bag and go and everything's already in there. So that's tip number one is help set your child up for success by having the home space really conducive to doing schoolwork and to being together and, and getting that work done. Danielle, take us away for tip two. Um, this leads to routines. Now, I can attest to the fact that home, school, work, sports schedules, all of that can get pretty, pretty busy. So keeping a routine is a goal, it's important, but I understand that it's not always achievable to be on any given day. That in mind though, let your kids know what to expect. Maybe on Tuesday you have soccer and cross country or writer's club after school, whatever it may be, let them know the plan ahead of time. Um, for example, for my son, I have a calendar in his desk area with just events for the week. So even though the day to day may look differently, he knows what to expect. He can go into his day knowing what is coming up. This also is really, really important to help build time management skills 
and to be able to attend to the task at hand when that time is there. So for example, one of the questions I like to ask my students as well as my own kids is, it's basically a three-part question. What do you need to do? When do you need to do it? And how long do you think it's gonna take? That helps them cognitively build the, the metacognition of planning and assessing how long things are gonna take. If you know that every morning you need to accomplish X, Y, Z, building in that time for them to um, think, okay, it's gonna take me three minutes to brush my teeth, it's gonna take me four minutes to shout, whatever it may be, they can plan out their morning and build that routine in continuously and they can help with those um, focus and time management issues. Okay, tip number three. It's all you, Danielle. Okay, um, in my former roles, in, I also worked in Burbank Unified for years, and part of the biggest thing that I did was I helped students with their executive skills, and a lot of that had to do with organization. And especially, I saw some people in the chat mention that they have middle schoolers my caution to you as a middle school parent is don't expect that they, oh, they're older now. They get it. They know how to do it. They don't need me anymore. Yes, they do. They really, really do. And especially when they begin juggling multiple classes, multiple teachers, multiple systems, they really need that kind of uh, regular, regularly scheduled check with um, either a parent or a teacher or someone where you take time to, okay, let's go through your backpack. Let's go through your binder. Do you still need this? Oh, should we file this? Oh, wait, we forgot to turn this in. Does your teacher know that you have it? Those regularly scheduled checks not only help build that executive skill with your student, but it's really great for you as a parent to keep in touch with what they're doing in school. So here I have some visuals of some different organizational systems that I've used with students and my own kids in the past. And what I tell parents and kids is there's not a one size fits all. What works for you may not work for someone else. So for example, some students really love a binder. My experience has been that some students when they're rushing, going from class to class or coming home, throwing everything in their backpack, they wanna do the shove it in and things get lost and disorganized. So sometimes the binder is not a fast shove it in method. So for example, on the left side of your screen, you see an expandable file folder. I've found those to be really, really useful for the students who need that structure. However, they still get the satisfaction of shoving it in really quickly, but hopefully they get it in the right spot. And then I'm a huge fan of sticky notes and tabs those binder clips that you see there are great for, um, for example, if they have a planner, you can clip it on that week and then they just open it right away and then they don't have to thumb through and be like, where am I supposed to write down my homework? Little tips like that. So try some different systems, see what works for you and your student, but my biggest tip is to follow through with it and check you know, like I said, once a week, do a backpack clean out, a, a check, so that you can manage and monitor how that system is working for your child. I uh, am the mother of a boy, and thank <laughs> goodness he's become more organized over the years. It did not initially begin that way, and I would find that every, you know, four to six weeks, we do a backpack clean out, and I would find a sandwich in there from week two of school that had taken on a life of its own, and was growing mold cultures. But I also noticed that he had a tendency to stuff those um, clear divider pockets with every handout he'd ever been given ever. Even if it had fallen on the floor and gotten crumpled to a million pieces, he would jam it in there. And those poor sleeves ended up being about six inches thick, just jammed and straining at the seams. And 
the process of going through that with him and dividing it all into piles, what's a keep, what's a take to school, what's a keep at home, what can get thrown away. Modeling that process for our kids is so important. It helps teach them how to do this when they're grown. And it doesn't take long, but Danielle's right. You do think that by middle school, they don't need that anymore, but that's actually the time of their lives when they're finally awake to systems of organization and they're leaning into needing one. They're aware that they've got to have one. So now it's time for you to demonstrate systems that might work for them. And like Danielle said, practice with a couple of different kinds. It, it doesn't matter what system you use, it just matters that they have a system, that's all. And the great part about how that reinforces schoolwork is when kids come to class, we can see as their teachers, which ones have a color coding system, which ones are using post-it notes, which ones have a cool set of clips, or which ones are using the, the binder sleeves and tucking things in, and that's all organized. And we reinforce that by when we hand them papers or hand back work, we can see where they should put it. And we speak to that. We say, oh, that goes in the green section. So it's a way we can work together as a team to make sure your kid stays organized. Before we move on to the next section, do you have any questions for us about organization at school? We'd be happy to take your questions. You can either unmute yourself or go ahead and um, type it in the chat. I don't see any do you, questions. Do you know if lockers will be available again? Hmm, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I the binders make that. the backpack really heavy. And so if they didn't have to carry all their stuff every day then that'd be a huge help narane do you know lena do you know um i think it might be a school to school decision um, okay. um so ask ask your school and and um see what they say i don't what, um one one tip that i used to tell my middle schoolers is for whatever reason they would be reticent to use their locker even though they had access to one and they would carry 8,000 pounds of books and notebooks and whatever else was in that backpack. And so what, what we would encourage them to do is, first of all, use their locker if they had one, but if not, plan ahead like, okay, what do I need for the next two classes? And only carry two classes at a time. So if they're not gonna use a locker, can you work out a system with a teacher where you keep, you know, x notebook in that class and then pick it up after nutrition or whatever it may be or if you have an elementary student those um extra items that like for example my third grade daughter carries around like the cute little pencil boxes and whatnot is that necessary to carry or can we maybe leave it um so that it doesn't get so heavy mm -hmm. right that's a good idea any other organization questions? Okay. All right. Yes. Oh, Mr. Sam is back. He's having. Um, I got trouble. a problem with the internet. That's so. okay. That's okay. We're gonna. Um, I don't know if we can add you back to the uh, to, to the the channel. Um, so, um, if if families, let me see if I can do that. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to interrupt your no problem presentation. I'm dead. That. I'm sorry too. Yeah, because of Miss Miss Aurora, she's in my office mm. and she's next to me, so I cannot uh, do it in my in my my desk. That's why I come out, and because of that, the internet is kind of you know, unstable. One mm. thing I while we wait for um, that to to work out, one thing I did want to piggyback on that Rebecca had brought up is the importance of modeling for your child. So we, as parents, are our kids' first role models. They look to us, they see how we handle things in life, how we organize things, how we approach things, our work ethics, all those things they, they see. So on the topic of organization, not everybody's the most organized person, but that's okay. Try and develop a system that works for you and feel free to be open with your child and be like, this is something I'm working on too. Let's try this together. Um, 
And because sometimes kids are like, oh, what's wrong with me? Like, how come it's hard for me? How come I lose everything? So having that open dialogue of saying like, you're not alone in this. This is a skill that is taught, that is learned, that takes time. And we're going to learn it together. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Narnie, should we keep going? Yes, please keep going. Thank okay. You. Our next category that you can be supportive at home is a really important one, and it's the actual academics themselves. Your kids are coming to school because they're here to learn, and they're here to learn things that bring them both joy in life and help them uncover passions and areas of interest, but also how to be set up for success in the world of work wherever they're headed. So academically, there are some really important zones where you can be a support to them right off the bat, starting from when they're very little. It's so important to foster a culture of reading in the home, and that can take on so many different forms. And the good news is, is it's not hard to do. It just requires intentionality. The first way you can begin is by reading to your child. When they do research on connectedness to parents and about the family bond and the dynamic, children often say that quiet reading time with a parent or a guardian is some of the best, most solidifying experiences they have to ground who they are as people and how they feel safe in the world is when they're reading with a parent or a loved one. So on a nurturing level alone, reading with your child is a very important parental activity. The wonderful boost it also gives them is an academic one. It exposes your sons and daughters and children to lots of vocabulary, to lots of different kinds of words, different people, different places, different experiences, and different journeys. And they can see how people on earth live, and, and animals and aliens and all kinds of other creatures live together, solve problems together, experience joy together. So definitely make time for reading. I said, I'm the mother of a boy. He invented our family reading time. Of course, he called it fart family reading time. And he said, as a family, we fart <laughs> together. So pardon me for the course talk, but um, letting him name it and decide when we did it also made him very enthusiastic about reading. So definitely read together as a family, have book clubs together where all of you read a certain kind of book together, like an illustrated novel or a book about, you know, guinea pigs or a science fiction story, read together. Another thing that can be fun is uh, trips to the library to check out books. My mom had a rule that if I could carry it out of the building, I could take it home from the library. And the library did not have a limit on books you could check out. So I would often take 20, 30, 40 picture books or chapter books to the car. And my mom eventually sewed me a tote bag and all the books went in the tote bag. And I held on to that tote bag until I was 27 years old. And it finally fell apart and she made me a new one. But have fun going to the library, go to the bookstore, look at covers together, talk about the art on the covers, talk about why some books are really huge and why some are really skinny and why some look strange with all the text in the center and that's poetry and why some have illustrations in, in the pages. Have fun talking about books. When you read, um, like, yes. No, go ahead. Okay. When you read together, play games, sound out hard words, make the letter sounds, use um, the language of reading and letters and the alphabet in your hopscotch, in your freeze tag games. Whenever you're in the grocery store, sound out words and word sounds together. Play all kinds of games around um, language and reading that you can. And finally, create an environment where a kid can't help but see printed text, whether it be um, a place where they can help you sort the mail, whether you have a magazine basket or a book basket, whether they have a bookshelf in their room with books that are just theirs. I can't tell you how important that is as a nurturing element for children as well, to have books that are their very own on a shelf that's their very own. Whatever you can do. I'm in my son's room. He's away at college now, but I'm sitting right next to his bookshelf and it's filled with the books that we've bought him over time. And he comes home and enjoys looking back at what he's read and feels really proud that, that he's been a big reader since he was very little. Danielle, did you want to add anything to tip four? I did. And this is going to vary depending on what age your, your children are. But 
<clears throat> when our kids were little, I remember a good friend of mine had every cabinet in her kitchen labeled with what was in there. And that helped students or children make the connection of, oh, this is a spoon, sp spoon. Oh, that's where the spoons are. Mm -hmm. And on the other note too, if you have English language learners or you're an English language learner at home, that's another great way to help acquire vocabulary as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes- oh, and don't forget the power of audiobooks. It yes. doesn't need to necessarily be text to instill that love of a good story or podcast all right we have some additional um things to go with reading and by the way this, this slide deck is yours anybody who attends the session will have access to the slide deck and so there's a little kind of a bookmarky guide here that says what good readers do so as you're reading together anytime you have an opportunity to sound out words or to use clues from inside a sentence to help your child know what a new word they've never seen before means are really important and also instead of providing all the answers when your child wants to know about a word that they don't recognize or a sentence or a situation that's unclear to them your first instinct might be to answer the question and tell them but i'd like you we would like you to try asking questions what else do you see is happening in this passage? What do you think is going on? What does that letter sound make? Really pull out of them the answers and that helps build their reading muscle. And I am noticing Rebecca in the chat, uh, only a couple of people have responded, but it seems like we might have some older students in our audience. Mm -hmm. So I think our next slide yeah. is really a great discussion starter because it's really um, comfortable to say, oh, what are you reading? How is it? Good, right? I'm sure you've all as parents gotten that. So uh, ask more specific questions and you can elicit a deeper response. You'll build reading comprehension. You'll build those critical thinking skills as they think to engage in discussion with you. So this slide here, he just has a few sentence stems that you can use with really any age student, but it, some of them are great for your older kids. So mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, oh, what are you reading in school? Great. Do you like it? What's your favorite part? That's kind of like the standard question. Mm -hmm. Try and vary your questions so that they're more unique. And that goes truly for anything. We're going to speak later about, um, you know, building connections with your kids. But for example, what does the place look like in your head as you're reading? Wow, mm -hmm. that's a great imaginative question starter. If I'm reading a high level text and maybe I don't understand all the words, but I'm having some pictures in my head, that can be a discussion between you and your child about well, what, what words make you think that? Or, you know, are there any things, are there any gaps in your imaginative place that you're, you're um, seeing in this text? As the mom of a teen boy who really, he also was an athlete and he didn't have a lot of time to read. And that broke my heart because I was an English teacher and I wanted him to be reading for pleasure uh, often, more often than he was. And I discovered a couple of teen behaviors that I think you'll probably relate to, which was he found a favorite author and he read every single thing that author ever wrote and would not stray to a different author or even a different genre. And I thought that at first, and then I realized just lean into that. And the librarians at your kid's school or in the community or even at bookstores can be your friends. And I found that when I needed my son to stop reading Stephen King, because he'd read it all already, and to discover who might he go to next, I asked a librarian to say, if you love Stephen King, who should you read next? And then the trick, the final trick that I learned that got him hooked was whatever that first book was post Harry Potter, whatever that first book was post Stephen King, whatever that first book was post Wimpy Kid series, I got two copies and we read it together. 
And I built in a lot of warm, fuzzy, good time together about making the leap away from an author he just wasn't willing to come away from. So that's one trick. Another exciting thing you might try with a teen reader is to form a very specific thematic book club and have fun with that. If your kid's into food and cooking, read books about cooking or read cookbooks together. If your kid is absolutely into true crime, then do just that. Read those together and, and focus them on something niche that they're really into. And that tends to ha help the teens a little bit more. Okay, tip five. Danielle, will you talk to us about math? Math is everywhere. It is in the world all around us, whether you are little or big or paying your own bills or not. Math is uh, such an opportunity in the world. And so if you're with younger students, you can count anything, whether you're at home, at the store, um, the laundromat, the library, anywhere. You can make number connections with, um, you know, let's say you're at the grocery store and you see different prices for similar products. That can be a conversation starter right there. You can do mental math, um, number recognition for your for your lower kids. And don't forget the uh, or underestimate the importance of asking the how come or why or how do you see those relating? Um, maybe even like you're camping in the sequoias. How tall do you think these trees are? Hmm, that kind of reminds me of ratio and proportions. If I'm six feet tall and that tree is 180 feet tall, how much taller is it? Little, it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be a, a handout or a quiz or something on the computer. Just build it in as um, almost like they're wondering why. They're thinking about the how come. They're trying to see patterns and connections. Um, and my kids used to like creating number stories. And what I mean by that is making up a silly story but turning it into a math problem of sorts. And they would try and stump me. Sometimes they did. <laughs> I think for older kids, one of the things that challenges families is that the way they teach math and the way we help kids conceptually understand math is so vastly different from the way we were taught math as children. And so there's frust real frustration there about not being able to help your child. And what you notice is the ways they're going about solving problems look very different. And I want to just ask you to sort of sit with that discomfort and not um, worry too much about it because the purpose of of common core math is to help students conceptually understand math in new and different ways and to be able to construct on their own models for solving problems using lots of different pathways because there are a lot of different ways to solve a problem to add to subtract to do probabilities to do statistics to write proofs there's a lot of different ways to do that and old-fashioned math taught us one algorithm or one formula or one way of doing it. And you just memorized that way and you arrived at an answer, but you didn't truly understand conceptually what you had done with numbers. New math asks kids to think differently and to approach math differently. So when you sit with your child to help them do math homework, you first might ask them, like, what are the ways you think you need to to begin solving this problem? What's the model you'll build to help you create an equation that you can solve? Tell me what your brain is doing as you build that. And then together, you'll end up seeing your child's math capacity grow as they tell you what they're doing. That's a really key part, is that your son's daughter's children can say to you how they think they should go about solving a problem and how they've arrived at an answer. And you might ask them back, is there another way that we could solve it? What are a couple of other ways that we might arrive at the same answer? So it feels weird. It feels uncomfortable. You're not feeling a thousand percent confident that you can help but there is a way you can support by just listening, talking together and watching how your child is solving problems. And as a former math teacher, I taught math for seven years at the middle school level. What I would always tell my students is, and as Rebecca said, 
we ask them to think of different ways to approach a problem and that's encouraged in your child's classes. So they're hearing how Johnny solved it, how Susie solved it, how Mrs. Smith solved it. And they're internalizing that and thinking, oh, well that way makes sense to me, that way confuses me. And I would always say, no different approaches, but solve it in whatever way makes sense to you. As a parent, I know that some parents are reticent to help their kids with math because they feel like, well, what if I don't teach it to them the right way that they're learning in school? Look at it as another opportunity. You're showing them one approach, they've learned it a different approach. As long as it makes sense to them, they can solve it however they want and as long as they can explain it. Um, I was going to say something else and I lost my train of thought. Oh, well. <laughs> it comes back to you. Just chime in. All right. Tip number six in the academic zone. This is our final tip for this. Oh, I remember. Okay. I'm going back. <laughs> Hit it. Sorry. Oops. Back with the math help. Oh, gosh. Um, um, one tip is just kind of a gradual release of help. So let's say you're helping your student with a math problem or maybe you look at a tutorial online Khan Academy something like that have them do all three steps laid out for them okay we're going to look at an example or I'm going to teach you the example we're going to do it all together you're going to see how it's done now we're going to do a similar problem but this time we're going to have the example for the first two steps you finish the third step okay now we're going to do a third problem that's similar this time I want you to try the first step. And so you're gradually releasing that um, scaffold, right? So that's a really good tip. If you don't feel confident as a parent to help them go through it, tons of tutorials online, but don't just let them get the answer and move on. Have them try a similar problem and scaffold. Okay, you do a bigger part of it a little bit at a time. Nice. All right, finally, the world has really changed. And in school up until maybe the 80s and 90s, it was about how much knowledge you could collect in your head. And that if you had a lot of knowledge, you'd be successful in life and successful in career. And in the year 2022 and the 21st century, it's the information piece is the piece that's become easily accessible. We have at our fingertips access to every answer to every problem of the known world. Kids can find quickly the names of all the continents, the rivers, every leader ever, all the wars. They, they don't need to spend hours and hours and hours at school cataloging and inhaling information. That's at their fingertips. What we ask of them now is to do unique, creative, critically important, and challenging things with information. The skill of being able to apply what they've learned into novel scenarios is the work we do now in schools. Can they communicate clearly? Can they pull evidence from the information landscape and use it to solve a problem or to persuade someone to do something or to build a new thing? These four C's, create, collaborate, communicate, and critically think are what's happening at school. We can't do that the best of our, to, our, to the best of our ability without your help. We need your help on the home side, connecting kids to information and resources that help contextualize all of that learning. What does that mean? That means that in school, when they're learning about the science of fossils and the extinction of the dinosaurs, we can show them pictures and we can show them scale models and actual fossils. But until you take them to a museum or you take them to see something about dinosaurs, it, it's not as real as it could be in our classrooms. Also, if there are things that we're excitedly studying in school, like, you know, students became really fascinated with pandemics and they wanted to know much more about the biology of a virus, you could research together at home these topics with them and bring the conversation home as well. That involves safe media exploration when they're online, so definitely oversee that. 
can also connect them to experts in your neighborhood, at your workplace, or in the world of people that you know who do the things teachers are helping kids learn about or studying in class. You can also connect them to community programs. A lot of times, communities like Glendale have summer coding programs or they have summer arts and entertainment camps. You can connect kids to activities and experts in the field so they can continue to deepen their skill set and kindle these passions. It's really important that you do that. Do you know when I was in seventh grade, when I was teaching seventh grade, I would have my students do a project that involved them knowing what you, their parents, do for work. And I was stunned that it was over half of my students did not know what their moms and dads did for work during the day. They didn't know the name of your jobs. They didn't know what your job required you to do. They didn't know how you spent your time. And I said, oh my gosh, assignment number one, go talk to your parents about their jobs. And so that's something you can really do to help your child is talk about your work. And finally, my final thought, and I know Danielle will add to this, is that like I started with, the world has changed and there are thousands of jobs that exist today whose titles we've never ever heard of and that kids do not know about. And it's vitally important that we always be looking at learning and connecting it to a job that can be done in the real world. For example, I know a kid is studying physics. Well, you imagine somebody who grows up to do physics for a job is probably a teacher or a lab researcher. What I was able to help discover was that most patent attorneys studied the sciences in college because most patents involve very high level science and scientific or engineering processes. And only those scientists can look at the patent plan and be able to see if the science will work. And so if you can do what you can do to help kids see jobs, cool jobs that exist in the world today and connect it to classroom learning, that's a really powerful thing you can do for your job. Um, and you were right, I do have something to add. <laughs> um, for those of us who aren't necessarily able to get them out to a museum or you know take them to summer coding camp or awesome things like that don't forget what the pandemic did bring us is the opportunity to collect connect digitally to the world around us there are thousands of virtual field trips that are available online you can visit uh webcams for zoos uh natural history museums, uh, Yellowstone, you name it. Libraries have free interactive programs that are here, you know, around the corner from you. So um, I'd say make the connections that work within your family and just try and expose your kids to as many resources as possible. Are there any questions about academic supports, parent academic supports? Feel free to unmute and ask or type it into the chat. Okay, if something comes up, feel free to type it into the chat or at least I'm not able to see anything in the chat. Danielle, are you seeing anything in the chat? No. I'm not either, so okay. monitoring. Mm -hmm. All right, we're halfway there. I see that it's 618, so we have 12 minutes left. We're gonna make it. Danielle and I are, are pros. We're absolutely gonna make it. We're gonna move into the, um, gosh, if this landscape isn't terrifying, I don't know what is, but sometimes the social emotional aspect of school overtakes the academics and it becomes all that the family can focus on. It's that powerful and that important. So we thought we would give you some tips to ease and make very positive the relationships that you have with your child, that your child has with their teacher and that your child has with with the peers in their peer group so tip number seven is about that i call it the swash that in between space between when school has ended and home time is beginning that is a space that can be really fraught if we're not thoughtful and intentional about the energy we try to put in that space so most kids experience a very typical scenario where they get picked up at school and hop into the car and a parent asks how was your day or what did you learn or what's your homework? And those are the three options that kids get. Or when a parent comes home from work and a child's been at home 
relaxing after school or working on schoolwork? Those are the first three questions that are issued. And those are very stressful questions, believe it or not. And another way to proceed might instead be to just consider this a moment to reconnect as just humans, as humans who have missed each other during the day and you're seeing each other again for the first time. Of course, there's schoolwork to do. Of course, there's homework. Of course, we hope there's been learning, but that shouldn't be necessarily the first thing you attend to when you see your child after school. So you might instead go get some food together or have a snack time. You might listen to music together on the ride home because a lot of times kids have been peopling all day long, just like you at work have been peopling all day long. The last thing they want to do is spend more time talking about all the people or all the things that they have to do. They need decompression, just like you do as a parent. You might also um, give them a hug smile, reconnect, and establish just that human connection. I always like to ask my son a really bizarre question just to kind of snap him out of that after-school funk. I would say, did anybody barf at school today or cry? Were there any bleeders? And he would just look at me like I was crazy, but then he would laugh and he would tell a funny story about school. And that was a nice way of bonding uh, before we moved into the more serious work of, okay, what do we have to do tonight? So whatever you can do to build a little buffer between school and home time, it's really important. One of the gals in our office who has a little one at home talked about how those that first hour after preschool, her son was wild, wildly misbehaved, pushing every boundary, being a terribly behaved child. And she didn't understand what was happening and she asked for advice. And we came to understand that she was expecting to move right into a work ritual the minute they got home from school. And that ritual involved more schoolwork. But this little child had been being good all day, behaving for teachers, following the many rules and routines. And there was just no time to let off steam, to release the pressure of being in performance of school. I'm a school child. And we said, give some space for a transition and have it be as zen as possible. And you will see your child return to the well-behaved child that you know you have. So tip number seven, zen transitions between home and school. Now that's not saying that you should never ask them about school, no. but definitely give that buffer, that decompressed time. Just like when we come home from work or whatever our, our tasks are, we need that whew, time. But I found myself falling into the trap of asking those same questions. What'd you learn today? How's school? Good. Anything fun happened? No, I didn't get anywhere with them. Then my daughter's teacher last year sent home the cutest little table cards. And I know you can't see them, but they are templates and you can find them online. My child's teacher sent them home as table discussions. And basically you pull one out and it's a little um, conversation starter. So for example, I just randomly pulled one. What are you most looking forward to tomorrow? Here's another one. What was the most surprising thing that happened during lunch today? So it's not like these are rocket science questions, but it builds that connection as a family, as a parent, as a child, and puts them beyond that just school is only for academics, everything was fine, I'm not going to share things with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tip number eight. Do you wanna do this one or you want me to? You do it. Okay, so this and the next slide, uh, really what we want for our kids is to grow up to be good citizens that can advocate for themselves, that can think for themselves, that um, don't give up too easily, that can persevere and have grit and problem solve. So oftentimes as parents, we want to be the lawnmower and remove all obstacles for our kids because we hate to see them struggle, but really allow a little bit of that struggle. Give them a chance to problem solve and think of a solution 
um, allow them to make their own decisions to a point, of course, you know, you're there to monitor, to guide, to nurture, but this is how kids grow up to be confident and solve problems on their own. So you can do that just by having that open connection, asking a lot of questions and encouraging them to ask questions of you as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot on that slide, but really the heart of it is we want to let them think for themselves with our guidance. Mm -hmm. So that leads into our next slide, which is still part two of tip eight, which is part of becoming an independent thinker who's had responsibility gradually released to them means that we need to build kids that are not fearful of engaging with grownups at school or with their peers around academic issues and non-academic issues. So what does that look like in class? When you teach a child to think for him or herself and to advocate for themselves, you see someone who's participating in class. You see someone who's not afraid to raise a hand or to volunteer or to, to take a role inside group work that allows them to exercise their voice and their thinking in public in front of others. Uh, a kid who can advocate for himself never leaves class confused. They don't leave until they're clear on either what the assignment is, what the expectation is, or what they should be ready to do tomorrow. So that takes some perseverance and some stubbornness, but kids who advocate often ask a lot of good questions. They also know how to keep track of their own homework and grades, and they're really clear on what each teacher's policies are around late work or around how work gets turned in, where, to whom, what does the heading need to be, uh, pencil or pen, the little details that each teacher asks of students. Your child, when they become an advocate, they learn those systems and learn to work those systems, and that makes them great employees. It makes them great friends. It makes them great spouses, great workers, great bosses, great people. They also know how to follow up when there's been an absence, when they have missed a deadline, when they've made a mistake. They don't flee from that scenario. They instead come right back and say, I, I need to turn in some work because I was absent. Can you tell me when you would like that from me and how would you like that from me? Or I think I missed a quiz. When should I make that up? When is convenient for you? So a kid who can advocate for themselves are engaging with their teachers around the parts of school that are, are crunchy and challenging. Also, kids can find and make study buddies. That's a really important thing, especially at middle and high school, is find a kid in every single class, ask their name, ask if you feel comfortable and you're okay with that, ask for contact information, again, if you're okay with that, and then uh, encourage them to have a couple actually in each class so that at any given moment, there's confusion about an assignment or a due date or something happening at school, they have a friend they can ask and that's safe. And finally, a kid who feels safe and confident at school, who knows that adults are there to help them succeed, will feel safe approaching a grown up on campus to talk about uh, an issue with a peer that's a concern to them or a, a tricky moment that they're finding they need to navigate they can go to the grown-ups on campus and ask for help. So encourage your child, teach them how to think for themselves and how to get help for themselves as they move through school. Um, I would like to add that when we created this slide, I was thinking to myself, these are all great things. This would be an amazing kid to be able to do all these things, both as a educator and as a parent. Keep in mind, give yourself some grace. This does not happen overnight. Mm -hmm. This takes baby steps. This takes reminders. This takes checklists. This takes incentives. This takes communication with your child's teacher. And it will grow over time. It will build. But these, what we have here on this slide, this is our goal for your students. Mm -hmm. But it can be done with baby steps. And like I said, if you have questions about 
like strategies on how to accomplish this self-actualized child, then, <laughs> then we're free to, to chat further with those. But um, just think baby steps and scaffold. Danielle, at 629, we have two tips left. We'll go quickly. And Narne, is it okay if we go three minutes over? Uh, yes, absolutely. And just um, we have a comment and then I have a, a, a separate comment. So a parent said it's hard to guide teens with complex issues, identity issues they encounter and be respectful of their point of view. And, and um, that's absolutely right. And it's a tricky time with teens and um, we absolutely understand that as well. Um, we also, I just wanted to share that um, uh, Ms. Kortoshan has to go to another meeting. Um, no and so right before we do our um, question and answer session, so she has to leave at, um, at least by in about five minutes. So um, Ms. Kortoshan, if you'd like to say a few words now or you want to end the slide and then um, we just, uh, she would like an opportunity to speak and, and um, about the presentation and the presenters. Uh, I think I can wait three more minutes. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> All right. right. Thank you. I just don't want them to lose their thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm glad that the parent commented in the chat about, you know, identity issues and challenges with friend groups and the social domain. The landscape of school is so challenging. And you'll notice that, you know, relationships can overtake the academics and can really be a source of frustration, confusion, stress, and anxiety. And one of the tips that, that we would like all parents to know is that it's our role to help them support and strengthen positive relationships. We have to model what positive relationships look like. And that involves knowing who your kids' friends are to the, to the extent that you're able to, to always be a listening ear and a loving source of comfort to your children, no matter what they come to you with. You're the only mom, dad, or guardian they have. There's no one else. And so when they come to you with issues, the first thing you can do is just be gentle and listen. Listen to how they're feeling. Let them unburden themselves. Ask questions you know, ask questions and wonder with them. What do you think that kid is feeling? What would you tell them to do? Like your children are wise, especially the older ones. They, they might need your support. They will need guidance. They will need wisdom from you, but they too have a lot of feelings, answers, and information that they can bring to a situation and help you unpack it together. You can talk to them about what it means to be a good friend, a loyal, reliable person, somebody who's there to help their friend be the best them they can be. And that that in, might involve some very difficult times where they have to be honest with friends about what they're doing that's hurtful or that's harming themselves. And I know for a fact, my son has gone through all of that. Danielle's children have too. All of us have had very difficult moments with our child and their peer groups where they get tested. And we need to be there. We need to be present, available, sharing of our wisdom, of our knowledge, not to freak out too much, not to react too large to situations because that is a repellent. If kids think you're gonna freak out, they stop coming to us to listen and to get help from. So try to stay calm and level if you can. Definitely keep an eye on their social media. There's so much out there that our kids are exposed to and you have to be on top of that to the, to the, ability, to the degree that you're able to. Check on their phones, look at where they're going, look at where they're spending their time and look at who has access to them because what you find there might surprise you and have really open, honest conversations about social media and what they're seeing and doing and what you're okay with and what you're not okay with. And finally, um, just some light education, just some just light Googling around developmental stages in adolescence is so reassuring because you'll hit phases with your kids as teens or adolescents where they're testing boundaries, where they're pushing back, where they go absolutely silent and stop talking to you, or whether they just want to talk about like morals and ethics. These are all developmental phases that a 
typical ch child moves through. And when you know those phases and you start to reflect on how your sons and daughters and children are behaving, stuff starts to make a lot of sense. And you take things a lot less personally because you realize they're just moving through a phase. And that little bit of research that you do will offer suggestions about how to support your child through those phases. Danielle, have I left anything out? No, I was just going to say there's a lot of research and classes and opportunities to learn about social media as well and cyber safety. Yes. Uh, we're past our three minutes over. The good news is, is that we have one last tip for you, and it's really technical, it's important, but it's probably something you already know, and that is school now has a pretty hefty tech side to it. And the more you're connected to the tech side of school, the more you'll know about your child's school experience. Start with the GUSD.net website. Move from there to your, your child's school website. You'll find bell schedules. You'll find teacher names. You'll find out about library programs and school lunch. You'll find out about assemblies. You'll find out who all the teachers are. Then find out if your child's teacher uses Seesaw or if they use Google Classroom. Get the class codes, get the access to Seesaw so you can see what your kids are doing in class. Find out if your child's teacher uses an electronic grade book and get access to that grade book so that you are always up to date on what's been assigned, when it's due, whether your child turned it in, and what their most up-to-date grade is. Remember to be patient. Teachers are human beings that grade at a human rate. So sometimes <laughs> an assignment that's been collected on a Wednesday is not graded until maybe a, a many days later. That's normal. It takes us a lot of time to grade student work thoughtfully. Use email to communicate with your child's teacher and use Parent Square to be up to date on the latest happenings in the district. Those are our 10 tips. I'll be quiet and let Lena say a few words to close us out. And then Danielle and I will stick around to take questions from any parents who have them. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I know that parents will have questions. Um, Ms. Kortoshian, the floor is yours. I just want to say thank you, Rebecca and Danielle. Will you join me to give them a round of applause? They were so impressive. I don't know if you guys heard everything that they said and took good mental notes because that's very important. I'm really blessed to work with such exceptional, intelligent professionals that I can't, I can't wait to meet the TNL team and to join them next week. I would also like to thank the parents that joined us tonight. And uh, we, you know, one thing that one message that I wanna send is, it starts from home. So if you help us at, you know, at home and then the school can meet you halfway, I always say it's a triangle of school, staff, and parents. So that said, thank you again. Thank you, Narna Hagopian as well for joining us. And um, if you need, I know Rebecca and Daniel will be open. If you need another training uh, that will benefit, and uh, I think TNL is always ready to support our parents. Thank you. I have to go because there is an event at seven o'clock, and I have to be there. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for dropping by. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So okay. I'm going to come out of screen share and we'll just go back to happy faces. Great. And then and then we can just ask our families to unmute and um, ask their questions. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll, of course, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes. So I will actually stop recording at this point. So. <laughs>